Thank you for joining us again at our evening service. Uh, we are continuing our series, The Gospel According to Paul, as we consider verses or passages from Paul's 13 letters in the New Testament. We're looking at them chronologically. The first letter he wrote was the letter to the Galatian churches. We considered Galatians 2.20 two weeks ago. Tonight we're looking at the second letter he wrote, which is 1 Thessalonians. And we read of the formation of the church at Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17. This letter is very upbeat. The tone is very positive. There doesn't seem to be any major issue in the church regarding false teaching or friction among the Christians. It's one of the most practical books in the New Testament. And in these five short chapters, Paul deals with a wide range of truths from uh, true conversion to integrity to compassion, uh, the word of God, heavenly rewards, suffering, prayer, moral purity, hard work, the return of Jesus Christ, the role of spiritual leaders, dealing with difficult people and testing spiritual gifts to name but a few. It's a wonderful book for new Christians to read because everyone can understand the message. Lee is going to read some verses for us just now from the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5. This evening's reading is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 to chapter 5 verse 3. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from the heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as the labour pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Leah. The big countdown is on. It's just 10 weeks to go to Christmas. And it's looking like this Christmas will be the strangest one in living memory. I saw someone online recently uh, suggesting the only way to get around the current restrictions was to kill the turkey and invite 25 people to the funeral. I'm not too sure what Mr. Swan would have to say about turkey funerals. But at Christmas time, we reflect on the birth of the Saviour of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. We consider his first advent, which was very much under the radar. Very few people were aware of the arrival of God's Son into this world, born as a baby in Bethlehem. But whenever he returns a second time, the Bible tells us that every eye will see him. And we look at our world tonight enveloped in a global pandemic. And we reflect on the word of God, actually the words of the Lord Jesus telling us that pestilences are one of the signs of the fact that he will be coming soon. Every chapter in this letter of 1 Thessalonians ends with a reference to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ for his people, his second advent. And there are three prominent reasons why Paul majors on this doctrine throughout uh, this letter. Firstly, some people in the, in the church believe that Jesus Christ was returning at any minute. So they stopped working. They sold their possessions. They decided to sell everything they had and just sit and wait for Jesus to return. Secondly, it was to encourage holiness among God's people in Thessalonica. This was a very wicked and perverse city. And Paul's encouraging them to live every day in light of the return of of Christ and we tonight as Christians are encouraged to do exactly the same to be about our master's business not to be ashamed whenever he returns thirdly 
some members of the church in Thessalonica had died. And the bereaved relatives were confused as to whether their loved ones would meet the Lord in the air as well as those who were alive whenever he returned. And Paul's aim in the letter is to rekindle their hope and confidence in the Lord Jesus. Two things tonight we see in these verses that were read for us. First of all, we see the comfort of his return. Verse 13 begins with the word but. But we do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant, brothers, about those who are asleep, so that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. Paul is instructing the church regarding those who are asleep. And sleep or rest is a common description of death, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Daniel 12, 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one. behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. A human corpse lies resting in the grave, waiting for the resurrection of the body. The word cemetery actually literally means a sleeping place. But remember, this is not soul sleep. It's a euphemism for death. The body and soul are separated at death until the resurrection. And it seems that some people in the church had given up hope for their loved ones, that they would miss the, the, the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. They wrongly assumed that there was a special advantage to being alive whenever the Lord Jesus came back again. But Paul reassures them, he comforts them, that in their grief, unlike the pagans, they have hope. He says you're not like these godless pagans. He doesn't say not to grieve because grieving is natural and grieving helps us many ways whenever we lose someone who has been close to us. But he says don't be characterised by hopeless grief like the pagans. Grieve through the lens of resurrection hope. Verse 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And this truth the resurrection of the lord jesus is the ultimate basis for our hope as christians because he has defeated the grave all who trust him will one day defeat the grave too paul reassures those in the church whose loved ones have died that their hope is secure because jesus has defeated death the great resurrection chapter of the bible first corinthians 15 tells us but in fact christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep the theme of Paul's teaching in the New Testament and in this book in particular is our resurrection and Jesus Christ's resurrection are not two separate events. They are two episodes of the same event. That's why Christ's resurrection is the first fruits, the down payment, the deposit. Whatever the Lord Jesus does, his people follow. Wherever he goes, his people go too. He died and rose again, and if we die before he returns, we will rise again and return with him. This is the consistent teaching of the New Testament. What has happened to Jesus happens to his people. You see, our Christian hope tonight is, uh, is not a hope so, cross your fingers type of hope. It's not based on feelings or experience. It's grounded firmly in an irrefutable, objective historical fact the literal bodily resurrection of jesus christ from the grave paul says this was a direct revelation from jesus christ more than likely referring to his teaching jesus teaching in matthew 24 31 and he will send out his angels with a trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other this doctrine is not based on the teaching of man it's the word of the Lord Jesus, so therefore is authoritative. It is reliable and it is trustworthy. And Paul reassures those who have lost loved ones of the events regarding the coming of the Lord. That word coming there is the Greek word parousia. Those who are alive at that time will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Verse 16 is one of the greatest verses in the entire Bible. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Paul tells the people that the Lord Jesus himself will descend from heaven accompanied by three phenomena. The shout, the voice of the archangel, the sound of the trumpet and the dead in Christ will rise first. So rather than being forgotten, abandoned or neglected or overlooked, this looks like special treatment, VIP treatment for those who have died. 
That's clearly what will happen when the, to the dead in Christ whenever he returns. We believe the Bible. We believe the promises and the words of the Lord Jesus. And time and time again, he told his people that he would come again for his people at the end of the age. Jesus is coming back. Jesus could be coming soon. In the upper room on the night before he went to the cross, he said in John 14, verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Every time we take the Lord's Supper, break bread and drink wine, we reflect on those words in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. After he was ascended to heaven, the message from the angels was unequivocal. Acts 1 verse 8. This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, was so calm in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. We are confident that Jesus keeps his promises. He will be true to his word. He will return in glory. He will take us home. And verse 17 explains what will happen to those who are alive when the trumpet sounds. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. What comfort for God's people tonight. I normally read these verses standing at the open grave of a Christian who has died. Only the body is there in the coffin. The soul of that person is gone at the very second of death to be with Christ awaiting the day whenever soul and body will be reunited on the greatest of days resurrection day when all who will be raised according to john five twenty nine, all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out so if you've lost loved ones recently or not so recently who were christians and your heart is heavy this evening your heart is raw your heart is maybe literally broken remember our comfort Remember our unshakable hope that they are with Christ, which is so far better. And one day, when the trumpet sounds, we will all be reunited. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. No more crying there. No more dying there. Because soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. This is the comfort of his return. But secondly, we see the challenge of his return. In chapter 5, verse 2, we, we are told that his return, the return of Jesus, will be a momentous public event. Paul here refers to it as the day of the Lord. In the Old Testament, the day of the Lord was an awesome day whenever God stepped in to rescue his people and deal with his enemies. When this day arrived, people will be divided into two camps. There will be judgment for some there will be salvation for others. And there was to be no room for complacency among God's people. Not only will it be public, it will be unexpected. Paul says it will be like a, this event will be like a thief in the night. Back in 2004, we lived in Banbridge and our garage was integral to our house. Someone one evening left the garage door open, and went open whenever they're putting the bin out. Possibly even left the light on in the garage. Whenever I got up the next morning, I looked out. I noticed the bin had been knocked down, so I walked out and picked it up, walking past the spot where my car was parked. Turned to go back into the house and realised the parking spot was empty. My car was gone. Thieves had broken into our house, or actually walked into our house, and took the keys while we were sleeping, drove away my car, and it was found two months later in Limerick. It was also unexpected. Such will be the return of Jesus. Jesus said in Luke 12, 29, But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. No one can guess the date of the return of the Lord Jesus. He himself doesn't even know when it will be. Mark 13, 32, But concerning that day, or that hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. This event will be public, and it will be so unexpected. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty two tells us, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it will happen. The twinkling of an eye is thousands of times faster than you can blink. 
it will be instantaneous the trumpet will sound and if we're alive we'll be gone in a flash to meet the lord jesus in the air and matthew 24 tells us people will be just going about their everyday routine as it was in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day noah entered the ark and then what happened the door was shut and only eight people survived everyone else was lost People were going about their everyday routine, having breakfast, going to school, going to work, buying, selling, doing housework, shopping, checking their phone, eating, drinking, partying. And then like a flash of lightning, Jesus will turn. No time for repentance, but listen, plenty of time for regret for those who are not ready. It will be public, unexpected. And verse 3 tells us, it will be inescapable. The verse continues, they will not escape. People will be caught red-handed in their sin. Two women working in office, one a Christian, the other not a Christian. In the blink of an eye, the Christian goes to meet the Lord Jesus in the air. Two men working on a building site, one a Christian, the other not. In the blink of an eye, the Christian caught up to meet the Lord Jesus in the air. So many people will be caught out, caught by surprise. They may be feeling secure economically or politically. They may even feel secure spiritually, having swallowed the lie that there's no God to deal with and no judgment to face. They are like the scoffers Peter mentions in his second letter who say, where is the promise of his coming? But we believe the promises of the Bible. We believe the promises of the Lord Jesus who said he, he would come back again for his people. Even though he said it 2,000 years ago, his coming will be public, it will be unexpected, and it will be inescapable. So the challenge for those of you watching tonight or listening who are not Christians, the challenge is that you're not ready to meet him yet. If you're not a Christian, then you're not prepared to meet the Lord Jesus when he comes back. Because tonight, to this very moment in time, you're still rejecting the free offer of the gospel. You're still turning your back on the only saviour of sinners, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the unavoidable truth is, then you're not ready to meet him. How long have you been hearing this call? How many times has God spoken to you, even in the past seven months during this COVID pandemic? You know time is short. You know God is speaking and still you remain unmoved, apathetic, unaware of the danger you're in without Christ in light of his imminent return. The next big event in world history is not the United States presidential election. It's not the solving of the Brexit crisis. It's not even the end of the pandemic. The next big event in world history is the return of Jesus Christ. One day soon, God will call time in history. The trumpet will sound. God's people will be caught up to meet the Lord Jesus in the air. And if you're not saved on that day, you will be caught out. Left to wallow in regret for all of eternity. All those missed opportunities, all those Christian friends and family members who urged you to go to church, to go to a mission, to get saved, to come to Christ, but you were too busy. Too caught up in work, pleasure, making money, socialising, partying, fitting in with the crowd. He's still speaking today. But if you continue to reject him, one day he will stop speaking. And whenever he does, the next time you hear his voice, it will be too late. Because it will be judgment day. Thankfully tonight we're still in the day of grace. The call of the gospel confronts you again this evening to leave your sin, to ask God to forgive your sin on the basis of what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Romans chapter 5 tells us Christ died for the ungodly. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. The sin question has been answered fully and finally. Our response 
is to repent and believe this glorious gospel. Romans 10 verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if that happens, then you'll be ready to meet Jesus when he comes again. The Earl of Shaftesbury once said, I do not think in the last 40 years I have lived one conscious hour that was not influenced by the thought of our Lord's return. Always remember, as we close, the, the words of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 24, 44. Therefore, you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Make sure you're ready for that great day. Jesus is coming soon. Keith and Karen are going to sing our closing hymn. It's entitled, The King is Coming. And the chorus says this, The next time he comes will begin eternity. The next time he comes, he'll be coming for me. Make sure you can say those words with confidence and assurance when he comes back, he's coming for you. Thank you, Keith and Karen. From the lofty courts of heaven Came a bond on earth to bloom, knowing when he left his father that his fate would be the two. But the grave could not hold him, angels rolled the stone away. Now the mighty rose of Sharon is still blooming yet today. But the next time he comes, he won't have to die for me. The next time he comes, there will be a Calvary. The next time he comes, we'll begin eternity. And when he comes again, I remember when I met him, how the Spirit took control. He established my goings, now he starts in my life's role. For a man to come from heaven, knowing men of Calvary, oh, I'd love That he gave his life for me But the next time he comes He won't have to die for me The next time he comes There won't be a Calvary The next time he comes We'll begin When he comes again, he'll be coming for me. Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. The King is coming, the King is coming, praise God, He's coming for me. But the next time He comes, He won't have to die for me, the next time He comes. There will be a Calvary The next time He comes We'll begin eternity And when He comes again He'll be coming for me When He comes again He'll be coming
Let's just close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again for another opportunity to study your word. Thank you for this lovely letter in 1 Thessalonians. Thank you for the truths tonight that we have examined regarding the comfort of the return of Jesus Christ for his people. We pray for those who are watching tonight or listening in who have lost loved ones in recent weeks or months or years and whose heart is heavy, whose heart is broken. May they be comforted and reassured by the truths of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5. We pray for anyone watching in tonight still not a Christian. May they take on board the challenge of the return of Jesus Christ. May they be ready when he comes back. We know that you're speaking uh, very loudly in these days, these days especially of great uncertainty in our world with this pandemic threatening us, threatening our health, threatening our economy, threatening the very way we live. But we thank you that you're still speaking. And we pray for everyone watching tonight who's still not a Christian, that they would run to Christ, that they embrace the Christ of Calvary, that they would push their trust in Jesus, the only saviour of sinners. May that be so for someone watching tonight. Thank you for another day of grace. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our great saviour. We pray in his worthy name. Amen. Thank you all for watching. God bless you.